Okay, well, thank you, and thank you, Claudia, for the chance to, to join this uh, discussion and to Schengen for, for hosting this here at, at IFPRI. Um, I have to be careful with water security because everything I learned about water security I learned from Claudia. So anything that I say that is, doesn't sound very intelligent, it's an example of how I've deteriorated since she moved to her new post. So sorry about that in advance. Uh, you know, I, I think it, there will be some redundancy in, in, as we go across this panel, but I think that this emphasis on arti the articulation of the issues is so important. I mean, a number of us come from the ag world originally, and I do, and, and, and frankly, I think the ag world does a much better job of articulating the big challenges and, and where we are and what's on the horizon than we have been able to do as a water community. When I say water community, well beyond this room. I mean the private sector as well, the utility sector, the irrigation groups, et cetera, et cetera. So I think really building up and articulating the narrative in terms that resonate with people at all levels is a huge challenge. And I think, you know, Claudia and Amy are very well positioned to really help do that and I think really can serve as a nexus for a lot of this discussion. And I, we don't have that right now. And I hope that, that, that Amy can really continue and even expand on that role. Because I think you have some of the right people there now and, and, and hopefully, that's huge. That's not insignificant. Uh, we have a lot of separate discussions going on. They're not coming together the way they need to. And again, converging into a narrative which we can all kind of live with that helps drive the discussions at the very high level. So I really encourage that and you know, hearing what, what Betsy's just mentioned about WRI's work, how do we bring all these strands together? Um, second, uh, you know, can we get ahead of the crisis? Because it never seems in water that we ever do. It's really more, or, or do we just prepare to respond? And, and you know, maybe we should be a little more realistic about that because, I mean, when have we seen big changes in water without a crisis? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Most of these things are not irreversible as much as we say doom and gloom. And I think maybe part of our challenge in getting water security on the map is that we've always tried to be anticipate, prepare. And I think rather than, you know, telling them you have to do this or else everything, just be ready, you know. <laughs> be ready so that what, maybe the strategy has to shift just a little bit to where it's not about creating as many, so many gloom and doom scenarios that it is really emphasizing how are we prepared so that when the groundwater gets overdrawn, as it inevitably will, frankly, uh, you know, it's not about, oh, you must do this or you can't do that. You can't do uh, solar irrigation until you fix your groundwater problem. Well, forget it. It's not going to work that way. But how do we make sure that we're helping, you know, countries, farmer groups, etc., as you're doing, to be ready so that when it does deplete, they can respond appropriately and the groundwater will then be managed better or there'll be other things. So um, I just sort of put that out there. Um, and, and related to that is the incredible importance of an evidence base. I, I don't think we have a good enough evidence base. I'm really thrilled that uh, EMI and IFPRI seem to be really joining forward uh, uh, forces. I think you know IFPRI has done such a good job in agriculture generally in providing you know strong analytics that really help to. Well, those are arguments we use all the time, and I think we need more of that in water. And so hopefully, you know. IFPRI's been doing quite a bit of that, but it's been really focused on the, understandably, on the agricultural water aspect. If EMI and IFPRI can work together to really build that in terms of the more uh, holistic view of water, I think that would be superb. And that would help all of us in terms of the dialogue we're, we're trying to have with our, our counterparts. Um, looking forward, uh, a few things that, you know, just the circular economy stuff and, and, and the rural urban link, I think this is fantastic. I think we, I think many of us believe that's where, I mean, we, I don't think we have a choice. It's not a, a theme, it's just where the world is going if we want to be, s survive and sort of extend this. We basically have very unsustainable <laughs> lifestyles and ways of living, but we enjoy that. Basically, it's not a question of whether we can be sustainable, it's a question of how long we can stretch this out. Uh, it's kind of, I'm sorry, but, you know, what we're doing is not sustainable and it won't be. You know, we'll just crash at some point. The question is how long can we keep this party going, and circular economy is, is really the next step in trying to stretch it out a bit, which is fine. You know, that's, that's every species would do the same, I suppose. So, um, so let's stretch it out a bit longer. I have kids. I hope to have grandkids. You know, I, I hope they can enjoy this party as much as I have been. Um, but then we need to start articulating what are the real benefits. And by that, again, it goes back to the analytics. Why go into circular economy? Because it's cute? Because we can, you know, I used to have a thing with my staff. It's all about going from this to this, right? Going from 
what Be uh, Betsy described, you know, this sort of moving uh, in, in a linear fashion, use, you know, abstract, use, maybe treat, and dispose of to, you know, just keeping it moving around and around. Um, you know, that's all cute stuff, but at the end of the day, we have to come up with some numbers or some hard facts that will move uh, that agenda. Um, the other thing is, what changes are needed in terms of incentives, whether it's laws, regulations, but also institutions. Uh, you know, if we, if we want to get to the type of circularity, uh, I, I had a chance to get to know a lot of the uh, utilities uh, in the U.S. and other parts of the world who are kind of in that space. And the first thing they'll tell you is a complete transformation of their institution, the types of people they have, et cetera. Um, you know, whether it's, a, the, you know, a, a Orange County uh, in, in, in their wastewater reuse and, and their whole recycling through the aquifer, whether it's, it's, it's uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona, whether it's, it's Windhoek, Namibia, it's a real big shift. So, you know, I would just ask, and, and, and then what, what does that mean in terms of how irrigation districts or irrigation authorities have to shift? These are not things that happen overnight. So, again, I would sort of encourage EMI as part to, to bring that in, not just the, the – not just demonstrate, which is important that you can do these neat circular things, but really start to anticipate what does, because it's, it's just going to be cute until there, you know, there's an ability of the institution to integrate it in their way of thinking. It's a big shift. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple of other areas that we're working on that we look forward in the, in the short term to immediately continue to work with, uh, with EMI on is, is certainly the, the farmer-led irrigation aspect. That's what we call the smallholder irrigation. You know, I, many of us call it the cell phone of agriculture, and I do believe that for Africa. Um, you know, I, I get into trouble for saying it, but this is a friendly group. But, you know, I, I've said to counterparts in Africa, you know, your irrigation systems were a colonially, colonially imposed approach of large-scale irrigation, which had worked in to, which were based on, on developing uh, plantation crops for export. You know, it did not respect local culture, local land tenure, local anything. And you're, you're continuing to replicate this. You have something that's much more endogenous, which is the farmer-led, that allows you to really adapt to what's there. And this is, you know, something that came from speaking with irrigation specialists from Africa. So, you know, that's the way to go, but it's, it's, it's a shift. So I, I look forward to working together, and Amy's already come up with some terrific products on, you know, anticipating how to map where you can do more sustainable uh, farmer-led irrigation with solar, et cetera. And then I think an area where we need to complement quite a bit is on this issue of financing and how to bring finance in. So I think, you know, if you're really helping to see, you know, here are the technologies, here are the approaches, here are some of the institutional shifts that have to happen, we need to come into that discussion early in terms of, well, what, what does that mean in terms of bringing innovative financing approaches into this space uh, so that it can sustain itself? And, and, you know, in that space, again, I look a lot at what's happening in Europe, U.S., and other places to kind of inspire, but we're moving more. Turnkeys are big. You know, because these are such complex systems when you go circular. You know, there's a lot more of, of, of BOTs and that sort of thing. Um, and also, decentralized systems are really, really becoming the, the norm. So I think, you know, I just put that out there because it seems to fit with some of the things that were presented. And I think that's a space that we're going to have to understand how that fits, brings the financing more easily in, but then, you know, work with you closely in terms of how that fits into the whole package because that's what will allow it to really take off and scale up. So I've gone well beyond my time, so I'll stop right there. Thanks.